Welcome to Municipal Affairs. I'm Christopher Brown. Today we are delving into a topic that often goes unnoticed, the relationship between municipal council and their sole staff member, the chief administrative officer or CAO. Our guest today is none other than Ann Mitchell, a CAO with years of experience in the province of Ontario and Alberta, and an expert in municipal governance. Anne's groundbreaking thesis, The Crucial Nature of the CAO Council Relationship, sheds light on this essential yet frequently overlooked dynamic. Her work underscores the critical role that CAOs play in effective functioning of local governments and highlights the necessity of fostering a strong collaborative relationship between councils and their CAOs. In this episode, we'll explore some of the key areas of Anne's thesis, including the argument for legislating the CAO position in every province and territory to ensure consistency and stability in municipal governance, the need for a standard CAO designation in all provinces, the importance of instituting a mandatory code of conduct for elected officials across all provinces and territories to promote ethical governance and accountability, the call for comprehensive governance training for all elected officials, equipping them with the knowledge and skills to navigate their roles effectively, as well the urgency of clarifying legislation regarding the roles and responsibilities of both the CAO and council to prevent misunderstandings and conflicts between them. So join us as we dive into the critical aspects of the CAO Council relationship and discuss how these measures can enhance the governance and administration of our municipalities. This is an episode you will not want to miss as we uncover the foundational elements that contribute to a well-functioning local government. This is Municipal Affairs. And I want to thank you so much for your time, for sitting down and talking about the crucial nature of the CAO Council relationship, and particularly your thesis that you wrote uh, this on. Um, I want to start at the beginning, if you don't mind. Why did you decide that this was the area that you wanted to dive into around your thesis? I was at... Uh, Royal Roads University and I was taking my master's in leadership and there was a, two streams that you could go through when you were developing your final project. One is a capstone and the other was writing a thesis and I thought because there's not a lot of literature on this critical relationship I wanted to write a thesis paper and delusionally I said I want to fix local government before I retire which was not arrogance it was just I knew this problem existed I was so fortunate that I had a great uh, thesis advisor through Royal Roads and some of the other people I had talked to about advising me, they said, oh, well, do just do a study on Southern Alberta, just do a study on BC. And I said, this is a cross Canada problem and it needs to be a cross Canada study. So he completely supported that because I know you know this and your listeners know this. This is the biggest problem facing local government is the lack of understanding the lack of role clarity, the public doesn't understand, the elected officials don't understand or choose not to understand, I will put it that way. So I really wanted to talk to people about this. And that was what was the impetus for the work that I set out to do. Did you speak with both people on both sides of the equation for this uh, hypothesis? Because the CAO, you can talk to those and they'll have their own opinion and then council will have their own opinion as well. Was it both sides or was it just a one-sided study? Well, no, it was both sides. And I must say, as somebody who's always been in the CAO role, I gained a lot of insights personally and career-wise, which really helped me talking to the politicians because they're on the other side of the table. So it started out with a cross-Canada survey and Municipal World was my partner. And we did, uh, I think it was uh, 1,188 
a, like surveys we sent out, we got a, a really great response, 866 roughly, and we compiled the data to the survey responses. And it was just phenomenal, the amount of people who not only responded to the survey, but also wanted to continue having conversations about this challenge. So after we finished the survey and the survey results, then I did narrative inquiry. So those were interviews with five politicians and five CAOs or city managers, but I wanted some equity. So it was right across the country. I picked people from every province and every area and also different genders and size of municipality to make sure that I was meeting all the needs and that was, it was as equitable as possible. So I guess I've got to ask the million dollar question, but that is, what is the crucial nature of a CAO council relationship? Well, the question itself, because you can't put the thesis question in a negative light, you have to say the question itself was, how can we enhance the trust and respect between CAO or city manager and municipal uh, council. And I think one of the big things, I, I created this, what they call a causal loop. So if this happens, that happens, right? And of course, the pure academics, which I came to academia later in life, so I don't call myself a pure academic. They said, Anne, that is not a true causal loop. And I said, okay, it's a quasi loop. But it was really interesting to me because the biggest, one of the biggest findings that eroded the relationship was role clarity. But role clarity had subcategories. So there's many layers of the role and the role clarity. Was council given proper orientation? Were they ready for the orientation? And I'll get into that a little bit more in a minute because through my experience as a city manager, it's a lot to take in at the very beginning if you're a brand new member of council, right? So orientation's always been, in my world, staggered so that it's easier to take in the information. The other issue is several provinces across the country, some have a city manager enshrined in legislation, some don't. Does that make a difference? I didn't really see that. So who, if you look at- it, if you don't mind me asking? Um, so I think Alberta and Nova Scotia are two of the ones that I know for sure. Coming from Ontario, I found it very interesting that they, you, it was legislated you must have a clerk. It was legislated you must have a treasurer. It's legislated you must have a chief building official, but it's not legislated that you have a CAO or a city manager. Whereas in Alberta, you do have that and you must have a city manager, CAO. Um, so one of the things with the code of conduct, and we've certainly seen it a lot lately, is that council is reluctant to police each other. So even the provinces that do have mandatory code of conduct that council have to uh, put in place, they are still reluctant. And we've seen this right across Alberta. There's been recent cases where council has adopted the report of a, a code of conduct breach, but has not input sanctions. So there's the study really clearly showed that they don't feel comfortable. If you think of a member, say you had seven council members, they're all equal. And so it's like, how do you impinge that on each other? So even if the code of conduct didn't had more enforcement and that was another complaint that came through very clearly as well was there isn't enough teeth in the legislation to try and deal with these rogue members of council I'll call them so that was that was something very clear one of the key areas that I, I found when I was reading the thesis was the the adoption of the CAO and it seems like from this the 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 thesis that I read um the role still from when it was originally introduced and you talk about how it was rolled out in the, like the, I think it was the 1970s, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong here. And, um, but the role clarity, you think after almost quarter of a, uh, almost three quarters of a century would have been defined by now, but 
it seems from the conversations I'm having with CAOs and municipal leaders that the the roles that the council are doing and the roles that the CAO should be doing hasn't been adequately defined. Do you get a sense that we are at a sort of precipice right now where if we don't define them, things could get more fractured in our municipal governance? I do. I do agree with that statement. And one thing I, I really find we can't always blame the politicians because <laughs> there's also bad CAOs and city managers. And one things that one of the things that is very unique in our role is we need to be that pivotal linchpin who takes council's vision and sometimes the council as a whole, where we work for the collective, not an individual. And we have to take that and say to our staff, this is how we're inputting this. But we also have to be strong because as principal advisor to council, you have to speak up if council is going offside or getting into the operations. And that's never that's never a, it, it's a very delicate balance. And I always say the city manager role is all about balance. We have to be principal advisor to council, but they are also technically council who gives us the vision and tells us how they want and what type of services they want us to provide. So it's a very interesting relationship, very different from, I would say, a CEO on a board because they get clear directions, profit margin, great, everything's great. We have a very nuanced role. We also have the public to factor in. And so we have a lot of people that we deal with on a daily basis, Chamber of Commerce, Police Services, every type of group and organization that we don't have any authority over. But as a city manager, we need to have a relationship with. So I think it's all about balance and influence. But I think right now in today's day, these roles need to be clearly defined. And that's why we started the podcast, because after I did this survey, I really wanted more people to understand what we do in local government, but I perhaps shouldn't have called it local gov cafe because unless you're in local government, you might not tune in, <laughs> right? Do you get a sense from your study, from your conversations with both politicians and uh, administration and the CAO, city manager, or even SAO up in Northwest Territories, do you get a sense that relationships in municipal governance today is strained. And I say that post pandemic, because this was published in 2021, your thesis uh, from the document that I read um, yep. and the changing narrative around partisan politics and how governance is looked at through a resident standpoint has changed dramatically in the last three years. Do you get a sense that if you wanted to do this thesis again in 2024, you get a different outcome? I do. I do think I do think I would. And even though it's only been three years, certainly, you know, the pandemic has created some real interesting changes in our society. And I think we see that in local government. And as the government closest to the people, we see the increase in divisiveness in society. We're certainly seeing an increase in incivility. And there's this general angst towards, I think, any kind of public body right now. And I think local government right now is the microcosm for all of that. And you're seeing a lot of it play out. What I worried about in 2021, and I'm even more concerned right now, I'm at the end of my career. I've loved working in local government. I've met amazing people. You know, I'm a third generation CAO. I, I just is this is what I was born to do. I worry, is there a lot of people, younger people, not getting into our sector because of all of what they're seeing in the news and the angst? Also, are there people that would be really good on the political spectrum saying, I don't want any part of that? Because it is 
you know, most most councils are volunteer positions. They're not full-time positions. A lot of people are doing it for the good of the community. For They love their city. They love their rural area. They want to contribute. But do you want to when you are being attacked, when your spouse is being attacked? I actually had somebody in my current area who said to me, now that my wife's passed away, I will think about running for council. And I think that's a sad state of affairs because here's a good community member who would never have put his name forward. But now that he knows if there are any attacks, it'll only be on him. I think that's, that just speaks volumes to me. And that really concerns me. In your thesis, you talk about the relationship not only affecting the day-to-day -day operations, but the day-to-day -day, uh, dynamics of what goes on in your community, of a good relationship between council and CAO. How does, and I, and I hate to ask this question, but I'm going to ask it in a two-part way, if you don't mind, Anne. How does a good CAO council relationship better your community versus a negative one? Because hypothetically, and this is a hypothetical, this is the second part of the question, is hypothetically, the internal dynamics, not a lot of people are paying attention to anymore of what's going on at City Hall. They don't tune in to City Hall unless there's a contentious issue. How does the dynamic of a CAO council relationship impact the day-to-day -day challenges or potential stigma of what's going on in the community? I think that one of the findings from my thesis in 2021 was, the very first finding, was that the CAO council relationship is critical to the organization and the community's success. And David Siegel wrote Leaders in the Shadow in 2015. It's such a great book. And as city managers and CAOs, we are in the shadows doing our work. We're the head of organization. But we're can I, also- Can I challenge you on that for a second? Yeah. Can I challenge yeah. you as the CAO? As, as, so you just said you're in the shadows. I would disagree with that statement though, because the role of the CAO is more front facing. Like if you hypothetically- brought this conversation back to the 1990s, I would have agreed with that statement. But in early 2000s, the CAO is now more, more of a face of what's going on in your city than traditionally some, even some of the councillors, would you not agree? I would, and I agree with that challenge. I think there has been some changes, and maybe David has to go and write another book, Leaders Coming Out of the Shadow. <laughs> Perhaps that's what it is. But I think sometimes the more divisive that we see the different municipalities or council, sometimes the CAO has to be more front-facing. But you're right, depending on the size of the organization, the CAO may be more front and center. I think what David's terminology referred to is that the politicians are usually spokespeople out in the front. But, you know, I think that when you're going back to your first question about the relationship, the the city manager of the CAO is kind is the person who sets the tone at the top and the organizational culture. They're also that person who takes council's vision and implements it. So in that way, they're helping council get their meeting their goals. It's also depending on whatever the city manager is, expectations in my mind is a critical piece. When you're hiring a CAO or city manager, council needs to know that it is such a unique role as compared to a CEO of a company because at every stage in history and every different time, that city or municipality may need a different type of CAO. So what I mean by that, have they just done five years of restructuring and do they want a city manager who's gonna come in and be a stabilizer? Or are they in need of restructuring or changes or focus on economic growth and they need a driver as a CAO city manager? So I think setting the expectations before you even hire, getting council together and saying, this is what we want in the individual that's going to lead the organization. And 
on our part for as city managers, when we're going into that interview, do not tell the councils what you want them to hear. Be honest. Are you a fit? Because in my mind, that is the impetus to the good relationship, setting up the expectations before you even get the job. Am I what councils need? Do I fit with this council? Meeting them and talking to them and seeing if that critical fits there. Being honest in that first interview is 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 crucial in the aspect of the building that foundational relationship to getting into a good relationship. But does the role not then have to change? Because I have been noticing over the last few weeks, few months, that people get elected. Canadians are getting elected or getting uh, uh, hired into the role of CAO, city manager. And then two months later, you're seeing them leave because they just don't see it as a good fit. So we talk about how the CAO should be upfront and honest, but does council not also have to be honest of what the dynamics is going to be around the relationship that they want with their potential new CAO or current CAO as well? Absolutely. They do have to be honest and say, this is what we're looking for. To give you an example, I went to an interview a couple of municipalities ago, and there were people on that council that were very clear that they wanted change and they wanted somebody who was going to come in and make their organization more efficient and more innovative. Right. But there was a few members on there that I knew had been in that position on council for an uh, extended length of time. And I very clearly said to that person, do you want change? And they said, yes. I said, are you sure? Because I am going to do that right away. But later on, and maybe two or three months into the role, I just had to say, I was clear. So yes, council has to be honest too, but it's this whole building relationship, like anything, Chris, it's all about the relationship. You have relationships with individual members of council and they're all extremely different. And I use the term situational leadership. So it's like your direct reports. You don't lead this person like you lead this person because they're different. It's the same with members of council. Yes, you work for them as a collective, but every time you're doing something, every time you go into a new organization, you have to start again, build the trust. And with every decision you make, then council sees, okay, that's what she's doing, okay. So it takes time, but it's that continual check-in piece too. You talk about role clarity and in, in your thesis, and I found this, this was, this is the part where I was like, why is this happening? And it was around the idea that there are some municipalities out of the 4,200, 4,100 within our great confederation of Canada that still don't have a CAO or a city manager because they just don't see the need of it. Can you tell me, and I've been trying to wrap my head around it, why would a council not want a CAO or why would they just not want to hire a CAO? Is it because they believe they could do the role themselves and, that, and we're talking about that role clarity again? Or is there something more undertone that I'm not thinking about right now? No, I think you're absolutely right. I think a lot of it is they don't understand what they were elected for. So your role as a member of municipal council is governance, but we never do a good enough job getting that information out to the public. And we don't do a good enough job saying, so you want to be a municipal councillor. What's your motivation? You know, do you want to go in and fix the organization? Well, that's not your role. If that's what you want to do, apply for the city manager job and make sure. I've run into a lot of really interesting people and they were either, they a couple of them were mayors who became CAOs. And I found that really interesting. And I've always asked them like, what was the motivation? One of them who shall remain nameless um, said that they thought that the role of mayor and the role of CAO was co-leading which I agree with because the mayor is leading council and the CAO is leading staff. Excuse me. And so what we have to remember is that 
your lane is here, my lane is here, but there is a gray area. The CAO will have to get into the politics to keep up the political acuity aspect because you can't be a principal advisor to members of council if you don't understand the political aspect. However, the, the mayor and council will sometimes, they need to know about operations. So it's this very delicate balance again of keeping them informed, but still your area is operations. So it always goes back to making sure that council knows what's happening and understands it and keeping the communication up, but also keeping the operations on the operation side. So there's many different ways that happens. Council can, I always say this, wander into the weeds or we can pull them in. And are we doing enough good enough job saying, here's your strategic vision and let's stick to it. And are we bringing reports to council that are high level governance reports or are we pulling them down into the operations? Now I, I know we have limited time because you're busy. You're busy uh, being in your day to day job, but I want to talk about the recommendations in your thesis because it has now been almost four years or three years since you've published. Oh, been a few years since you started this journey into defining the sort of the, the relationship between council and CAO and the four recommendations that you give. I'm just five recommendations. Sorry, I'm just going to briefly run through them quickly and then ask you. How have they gone since you've published this? Uh, the recommendations are the CAO position should be legislated in every province and territory. They There should be a standard CAO designation. There should be a mandatory code of conduct for elected officials in every province and territory. There should be governance training for all elected officials. And finally, we need to clarify the legislation on both the CAO and council's roles. And since publication, have you seen any movement on any of these or... Are you still hoping that these recommendations, because you lay out what we can do, how we can sort of move these forward of talking to provincial organizations to, to talk to the provinces and territories? Do you get a sense that your recommendations are being heard or there's movement on some of these? Well, I could just say no, but <laughs> I am a little... I am a little bit hopeful because what I did after I did a couple of articles for municipal world, but I also did this presentation across Canada at the different groups. And I said to the younger people in there, I said, those of you who are looking for something to research, this would be a great topic. But the standard CAO designation, one of the challenges, the different provinces, as you've mentioned, as is the mandatory code of conduct. I think one of the problems is for some of these to be initiated, started, looked at, researched, is that we need to have more cohesiveness across the country, which we don't have. I've really concentrated on the Canada-wide CAO group because they do a good job on toolkits and they implement them. Also, I'd like to see more of the political side, the governance piece. And I know there's a lot of governance, local government experts in Canada, and they are looking at how do we get more governance brought forward. I don't I, I wouldn't say nothing's being done, but more could be done. So I will challenge all of your listeners, please help us because we need these things to be implemented if we are going to make some really significant changes because I fear the sustainability of local government in Canada in our current climate. I really do. That's a big statement to say. Why do you why why would you fear? Well, how are we going to carry on if we've got people who won't come and work in the public sector sector, people who won't run for elected officials? We're losing more good people every day. And with the heightened incivility, as we've all mentioned, there's less people running. I know that I've talked to some different politicians here in Alberta and they're, they're, you know, they're good people. They're trying to do good things for their community. And they go, I will not come again. So the public wants to continue this incivility. And I don't disagree that we need to challenge us, hold us accountable, but the manner in which it's happening, it's deterring a lot of really good people. And I, I really have a lot of concerns about that. What advice would you give to a potential new 
and I say newly formed, but a newly uh, lit relationship between a council and a CAO because there's a lot of turnover in the CAO job right now, I'm finding. And I, I, I watch the job boards because it's what I do. And I want to see where people are having challenges and where people are not. Smaller communities particularly are having challenges of retaining CAOs or city managers or even town managers. What advice would you give a potential day one relationship between a new CAO and a council that has just hired them? Well, I'm a real big listener, and I think we need to not just listen, like the four deep levels of listening. I always, when I come into a new organization, meet individually one-on-one -on -one with each member of council and then sit down as a collective. And what are your expectations of me? One of the people that I mentioned before that was a mayor who became a CAO in Ontario, he said to me, he, he was one of my interviewees through my research. And he said, as a mayor, he said he appreciated his CAO telling them everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And there's a lot of us who want to not tell council, hey, this is gonna happen but we can't expect our politicians to make really good sound decisions if they don't have all the information in front of them. So being brutally honest with your council and understanding this job is not about love and affection. I mentor CAOs all across all across the country. I had one who came from the human resources profession and they were just mortified. Council, uh, I, I don't get accolades. I don't get, I said, well, you might wanna get a cat because that is the nature of the role. Are you a suitable person for, for this role? Because it's not necessarily a role where if you want gratification for everything you're doing you get that through moving the needle forward you get that through improving your community not necessarily for you know pats on the back so make sure you're the right person to go in this role and make sure it's open and honest communication with your council and they'll call you on stuff too and you have to accept that and go yeah you're right so you have to be open and receptive to the honest criticism back and forth respectfully and I, I feel like we've the last half hour has flown by, but I know you're busy and I want to thank you so much for talking about this crucial aspect that often doesn't get talked about. Um, I, I did not prepare you for this question, so I'm going to ask it anyway, though. Where can people find your thesis? Where can people read the thesis? Because it is a resource that I think a lot more people should be reading if they want to dive into this topic. They can find it on Royal Roads, but I will put a link on through my LinkedIn and I'll make sure I connect that to you as well. Perfect. So by the time this airs, the link will be in the show notes. So for those who are listening to this, scroll down and you can check it out. Highly recommend it because it is a well-researched, well in very important document in my opinion. And I want to thank you for your time for sitting down and talking about the crucial role, uh, the crucial, crucial nature of the relationship between council and the CAOs. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. Thanks so much for tuning in for another great episode of Municipal Affairs. I've been your host, Christopher Brown. Now, if you can, Consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link in the show notes below. And just a reminder, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button now. We have some great content coming up in the month, later month of June and into July before we go on our summer hiatus until September. So you will not want to miss our last episodes before our summer hiatus. So make sure you hit that subscribe button wherever you're getting the show right now. Until next time. Time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always, just keep talking.